One of the issues that Health Canada was quite serious about and made it clear was the possible impact of changing one biologic to another version of the same biologic. So let's say infliximab to a different infliximab. Either way, could be the originator to the biosimilar, one biosimilar to another biosimilar, biosimilar to the original, doesn't matter. We're not happy with the idea of changing because there can be subtle differences. And what could happen is that you lose the effect of that drug or you may have a reaction and we don't know yet. And for each biologic that has come out, we've always tried to know, but when changes were made, sometimes people were surprised that we lost biologics because of problems. Especially if you had something like insulin, if that was made and caused a problem, then your body would make you allergic to insulin. We couldn't even give it to you anymore. So we have to be very careful with this. One of the questions that comes up though is, well, if I'm getting an infusion or if I'm picking it up at a pharmacy or I have it delivered to me, who's deciding? Who can make that change? I have to say sometimes, even with prescription drugs, I get confused about this. The issue is really not simple because even if there was an answer, it's different from almost every jurisdiction. Province by province and territory by territory, there are differences. And in practice, whether it's a distribution center, your community pharmacist, we don't know. People are making decisions. Ideally, the feeling is that if you are going to be changing, it should be made by a physician. Your physician should make that decision. And your physician should know that they would not be changing you from one infliximab to another infliximab unless we have the data that supports that. If we see that, I as a physician would then say, I didn't know that, but I'd like to know, and I'd like to know that on an ongoing basis, year to year, that's still true. Otherwise, if we're with drug A, I wanna stay with drug A, and I'm not moving it to drug A star. I wanna know that that drug is the same one. I guess all of us are a little bit concerned that those choices might come up and things will change without us knowing about it. And if I was a patient and I as a physician, I'm almost con also concerned about those. There's no standard approach across Canada. Who can make changes is not necessarily clear. One of the groups that you may not think about, we think about the pharmacy, we think about the doctor, think about the physician who might write a prescription that changes it, but what about the person who's paying for it, the people who are paying for it? Whether it's your provincial government or an insurer who's paying for it, what if they tell the distributor, okay, we're not using drug A anymore, we're now using drug B. Change everybody from A to B. That's not right. Health Canada made it clear they did not want that to happen. And I agree with that, and I think all the experts do. This leads us into the idea of biosimilars and looking at it from a global perspective. I talked about all these other countries where these biosimilars are being made, where they're being sold. There have been different attitudes to this kind of change into the biosimilar world. In Europe, there were 20 biosimilars approved in the past nine years. 20, that's pretty good. Eight of them were withdrawn. Some, there were adverse effects. Some, they lost efficacy. Sometimes they really couldn't prove that they were equivalent to the original. The point is, it's a changing landscape. There's no easy way to do this. Almost anybody can make a new aspirin. And it would go out there, and if they did the tests in 20 adults, they could get it approved. It says, look, it's the same as the ones that are out there. It's not the same with the biosimilars. It's much more complicated, and it does involve a big commitment, not only in making them, which is an expensive and complicated process. It requires a lot of know-how and a lot of control because the world keeps changing, but also getting it out there and in the people who need it. Not everybody's the same. That's obvious. And yet sometimes approvals aren't made that way. Not everybody's the same. Not all people with psoriasis are the same. But people with psoriasis are different than people with Crohn's disease. We can see that. So what happened over time? Actually, infliximab had its first biosimilar in Korea. It's a product made by a well-known Korean company, very capable of doing this, does a good job. And it was approved in Korea. In Europe, it was approved a year later, and Canada a year after that. The United States is getting close. They're still not in that game yet. Partly waiting to see what happens, but also coming up with guidelines and when you make guidelines, you also need to make rules. Because if you make guidelines and people don't follow them, what can you do? 
So you need to know. If we make this guideline and it's not being followed, how will we know it's not being followed? That's important. And what will we do if it's not being followed? That's important too. And it isn't just important because you say, oh, you can't do this anymore. Well, when you make decisions like that, it has a huge impact on patients. If something goes wrong with biosimilar B and it's taken off the market, and now those people have to be changed back to the original, can we do that? We don't know. So it's a tricky business and I appreciate that the US is taking time to hopefully do it right, we'll see what happens. And what right is, we don't necessarily know. So inflection and remsema, as I mentioned, are already approved in Canada. And they've been approved for those indications there, rheumatoid arthritis, ankylosing spondylitis, psoriatic arthritis, and psoriasis itself of the skin. Now, for psoriatic arthritis and psoriasis, there were no studies done with either of those new biosimilars of infliximab zero studies that have been published or presented to the authorities. So they gave what would be called an extrapolation there. But they didn't extrapolate completely. They didn't extrapolate to inflammatory bowel disease. And I think they had concerns, and they're trying to iron those out. My understanding is that biosimilars are now going through clinical trials in inflammatory bowel disease to help with that, both for the U.S. and Canada. If you want to look at what's been done and the numbers of it, and this is not the number of patients who've been on the drug. If we look at Remicade, we're talking millions of patients. But if we're talking about the number of people that were in clinical trials and followed very closely, some of these studies can be up to three years or four years long. When you're looking at that, you're looking at thousands of patients over all those indications, including pediatric ones. When you're looking at the biosimilars, there was an early study done in 125 people with ankylosing spondylitis and a slightly larger number in people with rheumatoid arthritis. And yet, psoriatic arthritis and psoriasis were approved in Canada without studies in that, and inflammatory bowel disease was approved in Korea and Europe without studies. Health Canada pulled back from that decision. Another way to show it is with these check marks and X's. The reds are the extrapolation, the ones where we had really no data at all. We still don't. Above that, in green, are all the ones where Remicade had been studied and approved based on those studies and reasonable numbers of patients to draw a conclusion about the dosing, how to use the drug, how much you should give, and how often. In Canada now, we can use biosimilars for rheumatoid arthritis, ankylosing spondylitis, psoriatic arthritis, and psoriasis. The latter two, the ones in red, related to the diseases that I am working with, we don't have studies, but we still can have patients who get those drugs.